Welcome to Music Ed Tech Talk, a podcast exploring the topics of music, education, technology, and the intersections between them, with a special focus on the productive and creative process. I'm your host, Robbie Burns. With me this week is elementary school educator, Amy Burns. I don't think we've ever really talked specifically about like what got you into exploring technology because you, your technological knowledge is really wide. You know, you you cover a lot of different ways in which it's relevant to the music classroom. And I guess we've never really talked about how do you go from being a musician to a teacher to then finding a lot of relevance in elementary education with some of these tech tools. Oh, I mean, well, I was introduced to tech way back in the late 90s. My colleague, she changed her chorus room to be kind of more of a music tech room. She got a grant from Sound, but well, she got a grant and employed Soundtree to bring in Korg X fives, if you can remember them, and uh, and four computers. So sixteen Korg X fives and four computers and a general education controller or a GEC, as we affectionately call it. And she turned her room into this music tech room. Now, this was my second year teaching and my first year at this school that I am where I am still now today 24 years later so it was at Far Hills Country Day School and I didn't understand the technology when I graduated with my undergrad in music ed from Ithaca College I it wasn't required back in those days I mean it was an elective but definitely wasn't required as it is now so she was there for a year and then she had to leave because her husband got relocated and then they had to bring in a, t- a new teacher mid-year and they're like, just teach the new teacher how to use the lab. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I don't even know how to use the lab. So at the time, technology uh, for in music education time, ti-me.org, had these classes. So I went to Martha's Vineyard, the school paid, to go one summer for a week and learn how to use this specific equipment, the GAC, the Aquarius X5s. So I started using them, and I constantly said to myself, well, elementary can't use this. But then I started to see in my classroom that I wasn't reaching all the kids. Some of them loved to sing, and some of them loved, I mean, we had, I inherited a full set of orphan instruments. I was so lucky where I was as a new teacher. And I was like, the kids either like to play or they like to sing, and they like to dance, but there are still those kids in my classroom who just didn't like any of that. And I'm like, I'm not reaching them. There's got to be a part of music that will reach these kids or I'm not teaching it well enough. I was so brand new. It was just so much you were learning. But, you know, then I started to introduce just the tiniest bit of music and technology, which in the late 90s was Music Ace. (laughs) So I was teaching the staff and reinforcing it with Music Ace. And these kids came alive watching Maestro Max. I mean, this was late 90s, mind you. This is over 20 years ago. And then, like, I started to bring in (laughs) Tom Rudolph. Love Tom Rudolph. Dr. Rudolph was like, used to tease me because I was the only one who brought like digital performer into a third grade classroom. (laughs) But the kids took on to it and they learned it. And these kids who never sang and they rarely moved and they had a hard time with a steady beat. And all of a sudden they came alive recording music. Like all of a sudden it meant something to them. They owned it. They wanted it. It motivated them and they would record themselves. And that's like over the years I was going through all this and just introducing more technology just so the kids could own it. They could, my whole capstone research project was how kids could own, like basically learn musical concepts that are through composition. And because they were so young, the technology, the experimental group that used technology to compose came out learning more about those, those um, musical concepts because they were able to recall them better when they use technology. The hindering of using a pencil and staff paper wasn't in their way. And so they started to really be able to make music and create music and compose music at such a young age. As long as they gave them the foundational knowledge, they had it and it was wonderful. And then I wanted them to showcase it because I felt like if they couldn't share it with at least their parents, there's so much more they could do. Like they need to share it with their parents. And if we could get it out of their classroom, they would know that music is more worldly you know these kids are very sheltered in their this music is in their house or it's in their pods but they don't always consider like it's out of your state and then into another state and then into another country so really wanted to get a more connected 
resource for them. And that's where I was using so many different things. And then my school adopted Seesaw. And then all of a sudden I was like, now I have a way for the parents to see my music classroom that doesn't involve always concert preparation. And now the students were making music and sharing it with the parents. And then Seesaw has the blog technique so they can share it over with um, other classes using Seesaw. And then like Flipgrid came out and then you have Flipgrid pals from all over the country. I mean, now the students can see that they can connect to their music all over the world and listen to music from other students just like them from different parts of the world. And I, I just love that technology can do things in your classroom that you traditionally couldn't do. And when you can use technology to do something you traditionally couldn't do or couldn't do with traditional tools, that it levels up your classroom right like that, why wouldn't you learn it? Why wouldn't you give that opportunity to your students? So that's a long answer to your short question. <laughs> that was a great answer because it gives me lots of like fuel for how I want to structure my next like eight questions. <laughs> cool. Okay. <laughs> I mean, yeah, so you, so it sounds like your entry point to technology was almost like trial by fire. Like you were just dumped into the situation. Yes. That had the tech and the technology, this is, seems to be like a lot of my questions that are running through my head as you're saying all of this kind of pertain to just thinking about technology at that time. Um, like one of my entry points to technology is just that a lot of stuff today is really friendly and easy to use it almost invites you to take advantage of it from everything to some of the creative professional software to just the productivity software you know i remember when being in college and just having like tons of microsoft word documents open with my research and then i found you know evernote which is just like oh click this thing in safari and clip your research here and tag it and i'm like whoa this is so easy to use and i think of these these digital synthesizers from the 90s as like not particularly easy to use so yes. <laughs> being you know having this giant hurdle for you um it's it almost seems like the kind of thing that you know do you do you think that you would have jumped right into it had you not had to no i wouldn't have jumped right into it no i was i, I was kind of forced into it i'll be uh completely honest and i know i've said this before when my colleague changed over her room you know, it's just so brand new. I looked at it and go, okay, well, that's grades four and up. It seems too difficult for my kids. I don't have to worry about it. You know, and then she left and I had to train someone else. And I was like, oh no, now I have to worry about it. And I was so new to education because had I been more experienced, I would have been like, oh, there's going to be a point where I'm going to need to know this. Let me know. Let me learn it now. Like I should, but I was just way too new to know that, that I should have been more proactive. So the other end of the you know, thinking about t technology being much more difficult in that time. Um, the other end of it that I think about is just the student facing part of that. Like today with things like, you know, um, Google, the Google apps and Google classroom and all of these, whether they're specifically targeted and marketed towards music teachers or not, you know, all these LMS things like Seesaw, we've got music first. A lot of this stuff is so much more friendly to adults. Like I know that I, want to use a lot of the software more because I find it more easy and liberating. I can only imagine starting your students towards the beginning of your career on some of this very like digital performer, as an example, um, <laughs> how much easier does it feel to teach these, these technological concepts now? <laughs> so much easier. I mean, even like, let's see, when Michaela was born, it was 2009. So like GarageBand had been out for five years and I'll never forget. I was so pregnant. Like I was, about three days from delivery and like a day from leaving my job. You know, it was, you know, I was going to go on maternity. I leave. I worked right up until Michaela was born. And I'll never forget at that point. I was so, my feet were so large <laughs> and swelled that I had to put my feet up. And so I taught this third grader. I was like, here's garage band. Right. And like, it took me five minutes to teach it to him everything in garage band and then he just taught the rest of the class that day and i like sat up there and i smiled and he it was so intuitive then they, like he taught them and they went and they all like had i had a few devices in the room and they grouped up i gave them guidelines and off they went and like yeah it's become so much more intuitive than it was when it like went before i would say before garage band i remember when garage band came out i think that we i was at tmea and that it was 2004 and it blew our minds 
uh, we were at some reception or like, here, we're going to put garage band on, just start jamming and we're going to put this beat down. I mean, it just, it blew our minds to how intuitive it was and simple. Because part of teaching at every level is making, doing a lot of pre-planning that makes what the students do, you know, makes really complicated things seem demystified to them. And, you know, GarageBand compared to what you had previously been using, I would imagine, uh, takes so many more layers of the process and the tech out of the equation and just gets them thinking more musically. Yes, totally. Gets them listen better. Yes, I totally agree. And higher order thinking questions. Yes, it all comes in. And I agree. You take out, it's the same thing with the composition. You took out the traditional method of pencil and paper for these younger kids and you use note flight learn. And then, you know, you can blow that screen up so it doesn't seem so intimidating. They can get the notes on the lines and spaces, and then it starts to become a melody. And then they stop and they listen to it. And they, they are like, oh, the melody, this is the heart of my song. This is the meat in my taco, as one kid told me, you know. And they really start to listen. Is there a pattern in the melody? Who's your, I always ask them, who's your favorite artist? And if they say to me, someone, you know, a singer, then I'll say, did you know in that song, there's all these patterns? think about what you can sing back to me. And it's a chorus. It's a constant pattern. So then they start to realize to add patterns into their little short melodies. And then that's easier to play. And then they listen, higher order thinking questions all come out. It's really fascinating. Yeah. And I love that technology get, gets them over the hurdle of some things that they, you know, couldn't possibly get over the hurdle. Like some students have difficulty holding a pencil. And as much as you want to sit there and have them hold a pencil maybe that's not the goal for your class a day and maybe giving them note flight learn or giving them a virtual instrument, you know, a virtual xylophone would be a better thing for them so that they are making music. Cause in our goal in our class, a hundred percent of them are able to make music in some way, shape or form. So technology has become so wonderfully intuitive and, and accessible so that all students can make music. Yeah, you spoke to earlier how engaging it is also, like just how they were transfixed by the Alfred on the screen. And I noticed this too at every level. I mean, in the secondary level, I, I've i never had a more silent classroom than a group of general music. I teach a general music classes on the side of my band classes as well. And um, the class is never more silent than when we're working on a longer form project in Soundtrap because all the headphones are on, yes. uh, the screens are on, and they're just exploring a world. Now, are they always like... in? You know, there there comes a point where it's like, okay, we need to add some focus to that because they will, uh, they're middle school students, they'll go off the rails if you let them. <laughs> but, but the idea that there's like limitless opportunity and possibility in the box is, I think, really freeing to, you know, students who are about the age that I teach. Do you feel like it's similar for elementary school students or, or like, what do you think just grasps them? Is it like the multimedia experience, like the lights and the sound and the combination of different tools sort of leading them towards the content knowledge? Like, what do you think is so engaging about this technology? Um, I think I would say that this technology is so intuitive, but it's also these students are growing up, you know, like our, my nine-year-old daughter has only known an iPad in her life. She's never known a life before that. These students are growing up with phones and everything always apparent in their lives. And they're growing up with games that they've always played, regardless if it's Roblox or Minecraft or, you know, Fortnite. They've grown up with just these video games. I call them video games. They're really not called that anymore. But they're, they, they grew up with this. So here you have this premise of the game where it allows them to progress and then brings them back like because something, you know, they got destroyed or whatever. And, and then they progress again. And then so and they get used to that. So I always loved that, like, when I did my capstone research project, I had students who were traditionally writing seven notes in a 4-4 time. And I would, I would say, you know, we talked about this four counts and measure. They're like, yeah, but I can write in as much I can fit into this measure. And I'm like, ah. Then they would go on to note flight, and it wouldn't allow them to put four beats. And they try, and then they go, oh, oh well, and go to the next one. I say, wait, wait, wait. Why aren't you trying like you did with the paper? They're like, well, the computer isn't allowing me. So I'm going to just go to the next measure. There's something in like these students. That's why I think it is like a part of it is that they've grown up with this technology that has these guidelines and they kind of like, okay, well, they gave me that guideline. So I'm going to problem solve over to this guideline and, 
And so I, I think like they like that because it's connected to them. It's something they've always known. Like, this is what I grew up with. I have this technology at home. I grab my mom's phone all the time and play this. So like, I think when we bring that out in music, even though it's ed tech, which I think is very different than the tech they're using at home, but even when we bring out ed tech, it's something very familiar to them. And automatically they come in with a little bit more confidence. And even though they're going to experience failures throughout, they still feel the successes because I don't think they, they see them as failures. They see it as technology. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. So we think of music technology as like this liberating force in education. Um, but you, on the flip side of the coin, it is also the limitations and the rules and restrictions that it enforces upon the user that also sort of can be instructive and also make you creative. I mean, I know myself that I am creative musically sometimes when I have less to work with. Right. Right. I, I love that students, I know any elementary music teacher would agree with me on this. Students, uh, elementary students are very creative. And so when you give them technology, they'll create with that and you balance it. You give them acoustic, they create with that. You go through the Orff Schulrich approach. So they're going to play at a B section, which might be movement, go back to the A section, play again, you know, go into a C section, like, and again, they're creating. So like technology is just another tool to help them create. And you might be reaching that student who is not the mover and shaker, who has the challenge of trying to hold ORF instrument mallets. Um, they don't have those fine motor skills. You know, you have the one that is challenged singing or is embarrassed to sing and, and doesn't want to sing. Like technology, here's another tool that you can make music. And all of a sudden they beam up and they open up and their eyes light up. So it, it's just a, it's a great tool to balance out your classroom. Yeah, totally. Okay, I I have a, a series of questions or maybe a just a very big question that I wasn't expecting to ask you and it could totally derail the rest of my questions, but I would be fine with it if Go it did. Go for it. Just, <laughs> okay. So, so you're talking about melody as, a, as just an example, like composing a melody and having some of these rhythmic restrictions that are on you. I In my general music classroom... Um, I, you know, I tend to start, like we, t we do some, we do a lot of guitar and piano performance that are part of the curriculum. And a lot of these melodies in these books start in the key of C major, which pairs fairly nicely to the fact that garage band defaults to C major. And, you know, there's, there's a whole lot we can build around the idea of melody and rhythm and pitch and accompaniment and form before we ultimately get to some sort of, uh, you know, project that involves writing a more comprehensive song. I am very curious how you structure the teaching of melody and how that relates to some of these um, sheet music composition projects you're doing on computers. Like, how are you, because rhythm is, the computer will limit you on rhythm, but I know that Note Flight will not tell you you can't have it be in a tonality. Like, you could just have pitches all over the place <laughs> if you want to. Um, so... That's a, that's a, that's a, you're right. That's a large question. Uh, and there's, there's a few different answers to it. I mean, I'm starting those students at three years old and pre COVID I had a mommy and me caregiver and me music program from ages zero to three. That was free in my school. So I'm asking them to continue it this year on zoom. I already did one in the summer on zoom and you know, it's successful. Um, sorry, sidebar. Were you re were you responsible for all of that? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. Oh wow. Um, okay. So you're so you're teaching ages zero through ten. Yes. Oh, wow. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> um, I wear a lot of different hats, and this year yes. that hat is going to look <laughs> so bizarre. <laughs> like, but it's yep. going to look festive. <laughs> I don't care what that hat's looking like. I'm so glad to be wearing it. Um, so yeah. So I. I started the Caregiver and Me music program back in 2015, so it's now coming on to five years. So some of those kids, that's open and free to the community, so not many of those students will come into our school and be my student later on, but some of them are. So it's neat to see their foundational skills that like I kind of molded, <laughs> like that is cool. So when I go into Melody, I do start I, I'm influenced by Dr. Fire Robin's first steps because I use the first steps in infants and toddlers for the caregiver and me. And I use the first steps in music. I've gone, I've dove more into that. I've, I've done a combination. If you know me, I am not one certified level teacher. I am multiple because I, I feel like I take a variety of those approaches because my students are also different. Now, some will agree with that approach and some will 
battle me on that approach. And I respect any opinion that comes from research and uh, experience. I just know what works well for me. So I don't tell other people how to teach. I just give them a lot of tools that deserve buffet. So in my classroom, Melody, you know, when we're starting at three and you go through Dr. Fire Robin's eight step pro uh, program in his first steps, you're going to start singing those songs. You're starting with pitch exploration and then you're starting, uh, you go right into echo songs and then simple songs and then arioso, which is like improv. So I love that those are all your first steps. And of course you can rearrange, it goes into movement and then you end with song tales. And of course, you know, you rearrange those steps every day you teach because your kids come in with pre, you know, existing days. Like they had a bad morning. They didn't sleep the night before. Like you're gonna, mm -hmm. you're gonna rearrange those steps as what works best for those kids that day. But it gets all of that pitch into their ears and they're singing and and now they're like understanding head voice and so then as they progress through we're getting into kindergarten and they're ready mine are ready to start reading rhythm patterns now not everyone is but mine's coming from a longer process there so they're ready by first grade we're reading we're getting into they understand that melody has direction they understand that they're that melody contains you know, Western notation of notes and, and the staff and that there are pitches like mi, so, la, do, re, then fa, ti. I'm not going in the right progressive order in my Kodai training there, but there's all of these pitches that have, that they start to master and then they learn a new pitch. So now when they get to second grade, they're ready in my curriculum because they're ready. They've, they have this pentatonic down that they've been playing on melodies on the ORF instrument since kindergarten. They've been, they have the steady beat down before kindergarten. Most of them do, not saying all of them do. And then, you know, coming from kindergarten and first grade, they're understanding that melody has pitch and pitch has these syllables and these syllables have relationships. And then like they can start taking, those are those foundational skills. So now they can start writing. Now I do give them guidelines or you would have a composition in note flight of all ledger lines and then in sound trap of all sound effects. So yeah, right, you gotta let right. them play, but then you gotta give them guidelines. And I, you know, I don't call them restrictions. They're really just me guiding, but they still, there's still a part where it's student led. There's still a part of me stepping back. Like there's gotta be guidelines and I embrace the chaos. It's going to be loud in my classroom. And for most of the kids, except for my noise sensitive children, it's fine. I do always have noise canceling headphones in my classroom so that they can kind of go in a space and be able to be by themselves and create music and not be stimulated too much by the other sounds. But I do embrace the chaos and, and we do it. You know, I never know what it looks like when a touring family comes in. It's like, that's always when the tour comes in and you're like, oh no, <laughs> I'm so sorry. Let me explain what we're doing. I promise you there's a, there's a method to the madness you're watching. But that's where the melody goes. So by second grade, they're ready to come. They're ready to create most of them. I'm not, I'm not saying all. I, Robbie, I'm totally not saying all because there are students where I'm going to sit next to them and guide them through step by step. And that's like, if they had an IEP, that would be in their IEP. Like that's, that's what I do. That's what I'm gonna do. I'll have other students who don't need me over their shoulder so I can group them near someone else who is so intuitive on this and plays piano since they were two, you know, that can go and right, <laughs> help right. them and they'll know they'll get, they'll be okay. And then I'll check in. And uh, one of the things that I have noticed cause I'm teaching a grad class at Lebanon Valley College this summer is the question is how are we going to have students collaborate when they have to be if you actually get them in person they're six feet apart if you're online and synchronous you're online and synchronous how are they going to collaborate if you're asynchronous how are they ever going to collaborate so like that's been a big question and i love that note flight has the collaboration book creator you can have them put all this music in book creator and collaborate um soundtrap has a wonderful collaboration tool and i always tell my uh, colleagues and those that I, you know, I do webinars with, if, you know, there's BandLab EBU as well. So like then that's free. I love Soundtrap. I've used it since it came out. So I tend to gravitate to what I know and we pay for the EBU version. 
Um, but you know, there's great collaboration tools like in sound trap alone, there's the video collaboration. So even though they're six feet apart, they can hit the video tool and talk to each other. Yes, it's loud brace the chaos but from that they write that melody and then I put it into soundtrap and as one of my second graders told me I wrote the I have the meat to my taco now I need the shell the cheese the lettuce and we start talking about what makes an accompaniment so they start talking about drums and guitar okay good but like then I'll have kids put four drummers all together on top of each other I'm like I want you to tell me when you've seen a band with four drum sets and four drummers. <laughs> like most of them haven't. <laughs> Let me start going about listening. I'm like, where did your melody go? Oh, well, I turned it down. <laughs> well, why'd you do that? That's your melody. <laughs> go back. You can't just be the, you. Okay, you can give the guitar solo over here in the B section, right? Let it, <laughs> but come back to your melody, and they love that. Um, and then you know, Soundtrap has the recording portion. So let's. How about you this time? Why don't you start with you playing on the orp instrument or your recorder? Who knows if you can do recorder this year or orp instruments or, you know, but what can you do? Let's take a virtual instrument. Okay, I'm gonna go into Scratch and look up a virtual recorder. Okay, so you're gonna play your music you wrote on this virtual recorder and record that into Soundtrap and let's hear how that's, I mean, there's so many options this year that I have that I don't think I have had in years before that, you know, yes, it's not going to turn out the way I think it is in my head right now. I'm mm -hmm. looking forward to that opportunity to look at and teach music in a different way than I have in the last 24 years at this school. So, like, it's exciting. Not in a, I wish it was exciting in a way that wasn't under these conditions. <laughs> um, right. You know, it's not exciting in that respect. Um, there's anxiety as well. But that's how yeah, I approach totally. melody. Like, because I have all that foundation, I, that doesn't work for a lot of people because they don't get them until six years old. And if you look at the research for early childhood music, by six, they're, as Dr. Missy Strong says, you know, they're vase. We, they, we've been given this clay and we need to mold it into a, va a vase, right? And their vase is already pretty much molded by six to seven years old. So now all you can really do is just when we get them earlier, we can shape that clay and mold that into a large vase where then you can put so much musical stuff in it. And this is all missing, not me, <laughs> when I uh, describe this. Um, but when if we get them at, you know, six or seven years old and they've had nothing, their vase is very tiny and it's hard to fill at that point because you can only right. fill it with just a little bit. So how are you feeling it? Are you doing, is this early stage development a lot of musical listening? Is it a lot of singing by rote? What kinds of things are making sure that you, you know, build the right thing that you can then put? I mean, are you, are you aiming, I guess, it's, maybe I'm stretching this metaphor too far, but like, are you trying to build a vase that is that is flexible with what you put into it or that is bigger that you can put more musical ideas in it or that is just more sturdy um, that there's more musical knowledge to build off of i do believe that's going to look different for every child so i you know i'm going to like work with what i know works like dr fire robin's first steps denise gagne's preschool music materials i grab a little bit from music together i got trained in that and you know that's uh that's lynn right so like all of their materials and their research works. I mean, it just works. So I apply that and they're, you know, my goal is yes, they're moving to music so that they feel it. They really need to feel it. And I've noticed like yesterday listening to my nine-year-old struggle in three, four time, I failed her. I didn't, I didn't mold that right. Like she shouldn't be struggling at nine years old in three, four time playing it on the piano. And had I done more movement, I think in her her previous years, she wouldn't struggle so much. So like, I looked at that yesterday going, I need to move the kids to move more. They need to feel the steady beat and then they need to be able to feel those, those beats in pairs. They need to be able to move to that music. It's as well as listening, as well as vocalizing, all of that. It, it's a combination of all of that. And um, it's that, that vase will look different for every child. Like, even though you might give them all the same thing. It's just like, you know, two siblings, even though they have the same parents, they're two very different kids. And um, it's the same thing. You give, you teach and you bring these materials in and you 
use these approaches and all your kids will come out of that very differently. Yeah. All right. I'm glad I asked that question. That was awesome. <laughs> I mean, I've, and I could, I could, since like I could ask the same question for form, for rhythm, I won't because, <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but I think it's just interesting what areas the technology, you know, can serve those instructional goals, but you've made it very clear, you know, that the technology is in service of these musical goals. The things that are um, still at the center of instruction are, you know, things like rhythm, pitch, melody, and, um, I just, you know, it's just interesting to see, I'm coming back again to your, your background with more challenging technology to work with and, and thinking to myself how much less in the way those tools must be today, which is just, yeah, which is awesome. So th these are all creation tools we've been talking about. I want to talk about some tools that are maybe more like management, like learning management related. I know you, you speak about Seesaw a lot. I see it getting shared amongst our communities online as this useful tool. I don't, I don't know anything about Seesaw. <laughs> Can you tell me what is, what is Seesaw? Yeah. Seesaw is a digital learning portfolio and a student engagement tool. It's the best way to describe it. So, see so it's not a learning management system. It's not like music first is a learning management system. No, it's not like, it's not like canvas. No. Okay. No, it's, no, so you're not putting assignments you can, into it. No, you can. You can put assignments into it. You can put activities into it. And it's meant even though you constantly, well, maybe it's in my world because I'm in elementary, you constantly hear it being used in young elementary, but it's actually meant for, you know, elementary, secondary. Like it, it's meant for all grade levels. Um, but it's not a canvas. It's not like canvas where, because that's what I'm using in college right now. And that's like a one-stop shop. It doesn't quite do that, but it is a very intuitive and I feel a tool that successfully is used by young children to older children. And it is a student engagement and learning portfolio. So I can assign activities and the students can do them. I, in the paid version, you can put skill sets to them, meaning you can put little assessment tools on them. So when you go back for a progress report, you have those assessment tools built in. That's in the, the paid version. Uh, you also, it showcases, it connects the families to it. So not only do I use Seesaw in my classroom, I'm also a parent who receives Seesaw notifications. So when I get those, I, I literally watch my daughter, my youngest daughter, learn to read through Seesaw because she has been using Seesaw since she was four years old and now she's going into fourth grade. So I can go back, because it's Seesaw for schools, we had the paid version, I can go back and see all her journals since she was four and I've actually watched her progress and learn to read through that. And that was so wonderful as a parent. So it connects you as a parent and that's where I found it to be, I hate to use that word game changer too often because, you know, something could be a game changer today <laughs> and be gone tomorrow. Um, right. But that one, seriously, now it's been out for about, I want to say it's been out for at least five years. I know I've been using it for five years. And uh, that is a game changer because I struggled to have the children be able to have an audience for the, for the, the activities they do in music class. Because no matter what approach you're using in music class, whether you're using First Steps for Dr. Fire Robin, Denise Gagne's music play, or Schulich approach, conversational solfege, Zoltan Kodai's approach, Dal Crow's, you know, whatever, you know, Gordon, I don't want to leave out Dr. Gordon, sorry. Um, whatever approach you're using, there are items you're doing in the classroom that you would love parents to be able to experience. And your child will go home and you'll ask them, how is school? Fine. What'd you do? Nothing. Well, what do you mean you did nothing? You had this today. How was this today? Yeah, I think I had that today. Well, you had music today. How was it? I don't know. I, Mrs. Burns sang at us. Like, ah, you know, and so you want the parents to be experiencing things that aren't always shown in a concert. And Seesaw did that. So like I jumped on that when the school's like, we're going to do this. And as with any atmosphere you get in education, you have this variety of different type of teaching styles. Some who will jump on new things, some who will research it, listen, analyze, come back. Some who will naysay the new buzzword to, because they know it will just full circle and that buzzword will go away. I mean, and there's credibility to all those teachers. I love all those teachers. And I don't know where I fall. I think I'm probably jump, but it depends always on what 
it is. <laughs> um, so when the seesaw started, I jumped and I worked hard to show the parents what's going on in the, in the music classroom. And I noticed as a parent, I was getting most of the posts from me, like none of the other teachers were using it much. But after the first year, then I started to see it be used a lot more. I think it was just because it was so new and it got introduced in September that the teachers were like, okay, I see it there, but you gave it to me at the wrong time of the year, which was true. I mean, in September, don't give a teacher a new tool and say, use it. <laughs> like, come right. on, <laughs> let them, yeah. they need to build relationships with their students. That's their goal. So yeah, the next year, I remember, then all of a sudden I started to see all my, my girls were getting all posts throughout different subjects. And I was like, this is so cool. And then I started, I think one year I decided to put up like it was the night before the concert. So I took a picture of the risers and drew on the right, because this seesaw has every tool you can possibly think of to submit and showcase. So I took a picture within seesaw, took the drawing tools and wrote on 4H, 4MC, three this. So, you know, so they knew where their kids were standing. And I just sent that, I posted on their journal and said, tomorrow your students will be, your children will be standing here. Try to find a spot in the auditorium that you can see them. Right? So it was like my most liked post of the year. My mother comes to the concert. She wants to see her granddaughters. And mm -hmm. she goes, gee, Amy, what app did you create? I'm like, I'm sorry, what? What, mom? And she's like, there are all these parents walking around with their phone, right? I'm like, yeah, that's their phones, mom. And they're all like, Mrs. Burns' app says where we should sit. And I was like, are you kidding me? And they're like, yes. And my mom's like, what app did you create? I'm like, oh, I wish I could take credit for that. I can't take credit for Seesaw. But I'm like, mom, you're awesome. Thank you. And I'm like, yes, I'm finally starting to get to their mobile devices and they're seeing something different and they are checking it. Like I was so happy to hear that. And so like Seesaw is that. Seesaw is a self-reflection tool. It's a higher order thinking tool. It's an SEL tool, you know, it's a way to check in with the students. It's an online learning platform. So when you're teaching from home and you're not seeing your students, you still know you're connecting to them. It allows students to sing with video. It allows students to sing with audio. It allows you to use a drawing tool to write on. It allows you to take any picture you want and then mark up a score. I mean, it does so much. And then there's activities that has a whole activity library within it, all in the free version, which is like a free teachers pay teachers inside of Seesaw. So I can go in there and find Seesaw ambassadors who wrote music activities for grade level one. It's like 400 in there. And then assign them or copy and readapt it for my kids and then assign it to them. And like over this past spring when we were online, this is how we did our recorder stars and belts. They, I was able to send their recorders home. They had it. They logged on to Seesaw. They grabbed the activity. They recorded themselves and they were earning stars and they were thrilled. I mean, and I was thrilled even to the point where it was being mentioned in like a parent talk, like the head of school did a parent talk and one parent's like, well, thank goodness Mrs. Burns sent those recorders home. Now, I don't know if they said it that way or it was like, thank goodness Mrs. Burns sent those recorders home. <laughs> Not sure the tone, because that could be construed in many different ways, uh -huh. but it meant that they were pride, they were playing and um, it was a way I was connecting with them. So Seesaw gave me the opportunity. And since I had already been using it so much in the classroom, the kids to log on at home was easy. It was easy. I, I don't like to use that word with technology, but it was easy for them because they already knew how to do it and they could, and they needed no tutorial. They needed no piece of paper or any email from me. They just knew to go on and find me there. So Seesaw okay, is that. See. Yeah. <laughs> It's, well, it's a lot. It's it's simple, a simple premise, but it seems like you can, because of that simple premise and some of the features and tools they provide, you can be very creative about how you want to use it. Yes. Sounds like also like maybe a take some of it or leave some of it kind of yes. software platform. Like, you know, I think of, um, well, how, let me try to phrase this question because I, I can see myself using this in some respects, but I have to sort of, this question has to start as a statement, I guess. Um, so like in my personal life you know like one of the things that in technology that it one of my technological wheelhouse is definitely more what are some of the teacher facing technologies that make the job easier and more creative and more productive uh than 
so much the student facing things. And, you know, when I control the technology that I use, which, you know, it's easier to just install whatever productivity app I want on my computer, I control my computer. Um, it's easier to sometimes use lots of apps that are really good at one thing than it is one of these giant, you know, it does everything. I, I guess like a personal productivity example would be like, you know, I use a note app and a task app, but yeah. I know some people who use like Microsoft Exchange, which is to tries to be like email, calendar, task, note, you know, all of those things in one. Um, when it comes to student facing education software, you know, Canvas is great because it does do everything and our district is going to ma- support that our students are expected to use it, which means that I can expect them to use any feature of it, yeah. but it's not always the best tool for every job. And so I guess my question is like, with something like Seesaw, I'm I'm drawn to this part of it that's like a portfolio. Like I, I'm, And I have some follow-up questions about like, you know, how maybe your students are sharing their digital compositions in a second. But I guess before I get to that, like how, um, for someone like me who where Canvas is this supported platform and other platforms like for example music first are not supported like i can still use it but i can't i have to do a lot of manual labor to set up the student accounts because they can't have the students first and last name in the user accounts so i'm like manually doing what my district would do if it were on our approved list and furthermore i am creating manually a lot more of the integrations between things like yes it can send information to a school lms and it can work with soundtrap and it can work with note flight but i have to create some of the duct tape and strings yep. that makes those I hear work. what you're so, saying, yeah. So Seesaw, let's just say that you're an educator who's listening to you describe this and you're like, oh, well, I could, you know, it would be really great if I could just take advantage of one of the many features you listed. How easy is it to use, um, you know, in the way that I just described, like where you're just sort of personally not, it's not a, a approved sanctioned tool, but you're just personally using it in combination with your classroom and some of your existing other creative software? Okay, that's a great question, Robbie. Like, first of all, I want to clarify that you control Seesaw. Nothing can go on those posts without you approving it. You are the teacher, so you are the gatekeeper. And the students can only see their posts, or sometimes, you know, you can make the class see each other. And that's, but the parents can only see their children, only their children. So I do want to clarify that and Seesaw just like, Soundtrap and all and like Flipgrid, they they are um, compliant to you know the FERPA, the COPPA, all of those. So it was something I had to like research for my ISTE certification. So they are oh interesting. Yeah, they are all on top of that. So your question is interesting because I get that question often. And here's my thing with elementary: if you are piloting something that the IT isn't going to support you, you will be alone, and you need to take that and be okay with that. Because if you're not okay with that, don't pilot it. Because like, here's the thing, like I, I've had teachers say, I started Seesaw, but my school uses Class Doja. I'm like, if you're okay with that, but no one's going to help you, especially since you've gone rogue. You know, like if they, they have said Class Dojo and you went Seesaw, and I understand why you went Seesaw, but the school is not going to help you. Basically, they just watched you walk, turn your back on what they gave you. So like, you have to watch out for that. If your IT is supporting Canvas, even though Canvas is not intuitive, I'll tell you right now that when I work with it, this is not intuitive for younger elementary. Like try a kindergartner on Canvas and they better know how to read. Like that's, or they can't really use it. Now, maybe there's a kindergarten music teacher out there that can help me understand how that works better, that Canvas would be great for a kindergarten. But like Seesaw is great for a kindergartner. You know, they don't need to know how to read. They can, it's just basically using their iPad the way they would normally use their iPad. Um, but if you're piloting it's you, and you don't have that support, that's a really big challenge. So if you're going to pilot and Seesaw seems to be too big, then start with Flipgrid. Flipgrid is going to focus you on just video. So here's your ta- you know, here's your grid. Now they call them groups. Here's your group that's class you know, second grade, Mrs. So-and-so's class is that group. And then here's the topic, introduce yourself and hit the plus button, you know, scan the code or here's the text code, click the plus button and introduce yourself, you know, and they're the gatekeeper again, so they can stop it from being submitted until they watch it and things like that. So like, if they're kind of like Seesaw has too much, start with Flipgrid. If they're like, no, I want to start Seesaw, 
but no one in the school is doing it, then find a classroom teacher, for, especially for a music educator. If you can find a classroom teacher to pilot Seesaw with, you will be gold because the classroom teacher has access to the parents better than you do. They just do. And so they get the parent connection on and then you're tagged onto the same class. So then there's folders in Seesaw. So you all make sure you label things like music has the music folder, math has a math folder, language arts. And then the parents start to get used to it. And now you have the support of the classroom teacher and you two can support each other. So I always say, unless you know you are going to take on that challenge to be this solo person trying something out that no one's supporting at your school, that you know, but they're not giving you a platform and no one else is using it, do know like you're going in pretty much climbing a, a very steep hill and that you're gonna do that alone. So um, that's my answer to that. Like I, I always caution if you're gonna do something against what the school is doing or that you don't have support from that school and you don't have a buddy that you're like pairing up with. That, that's always a challenge. Right, like you're not gonna call IT department and say, I'm having this problem with Seesaw, what do I, where do I click? But, right. you know, they're going to tell you, sorry, use, yeah. your, use the approved thing. Yeah. OK, so so I'm just, you know, and I, I'm the kind of person I, you know, I think that's really wise advice. I'm the kind of person who's going to probably go on a limb and try something. And, and when I was talking about appro being approved in privacy earlier, our, our district is really restrictive. Like I, I a lot of these things, um, you know, we can use it's just it's just that name. And we, we use this. I don't know if you have heard of a protocol called Clever. It's like yes. a. Yeah, so it's this for those who don't know. It's a protocol that allows uh, different apps that support single sign-on to integrate. So that in that, is... yeah. Oh, interesting. So, see, I wonder. I'm gonna have to look through our approved list because I have never even look to see if seesaw specifically is on our list but yeah um like google apps for education um i don't know about Sound soundtrap is approved for us i'm not sure if it's how it is approved but canvas uh all of these things exist using this clever protocol which is what allows our students to be able to use the same exact username and password in whatever howard county district supported app they need to and that's kind of the thing is like looking at um our current situation like i want to use the apps that are engaging, that empower me, that empower my students. But with students already, but especially so when you're teaching at a distance where you can't look over their shoulder and tell them where to click, I'm a little hesitant to have a lot of different, and that's kind of coming back to what I was saying about Canvas. Like it's just one place, like they already know how to log in, they're already there. So teaching them a new feature, at least, you know, they already know how to get in to the system. Whereas Seesaw sounds really compelling, but I'm looking at the idea of okay like i'm ar already last episode um teresa dusaku was on and she like sold me on flipgrid so i'm already looking at <laughs> like maybe experimenting with that a little bit and so you know i guess it's just something to be aware of is like i, I don't know how how do you find like you're, you're about to start probably some students who have not used some of these tools how do you anticipate setting up logins, administrative work, how is how do you think that's gonna go? Well, I mean, when I, we've used Seesaw, I introduced Flipgrid last year as part of my ISTE certification process. I was gonna use Flipgrid with fifth grade instrument class. So we started in school and it was great when we went online, those clarinets and flutes were already on the grid and they, they went right in. But my third graders never used it and I needed a recording from them and Flipgrid was going to be a little bit more intuitive to get them singing with 50 nifty that song so um, I just used it online I did small videos going by dr. Barbara Friedman's advice on this small 90 second videos so what I did was like had Sarah do a small video showing her classmates how to get to Flipgrid and they did it this year because we are starting in person um, but the way uh, I will ha see my kids, also I'll see them certain grade levels for two weeks straight, 10 school days straight, once a day, 40 minutes. And then I won't see them again probably for two months because I'll cycle through all the grades. And so I plan to <clears throat> be using a platform every day so that if we go online, they know that platform, they know where it is. And when I'm not seeing them, I'm planning on using Seesaw. I'm not going to use Flipgrid when I'm not seeing them because they're not going to go check it. That's the thing. Like Seesaw is a platform where you're going to go check 
because your classroom teacher's on it, your music teacher's on it, your art teachers, it's all there. Flipgrid is an additional platform. It's not, it doesn't have the meat that Seesaw has and Canvas has, that's the thing. Flipgrid is this kind of supplemental tool, which I love and it's always free, but my students aren't intuitively online going to go there to check something. They will go to Seesaw to check their work, to submit their work, and they'll see the little notification from music and go in there. They wouldn't do that in Flipgrid. Plus in Seesaw, I can message all the parents. I can't do that in Flipgrid. Um, so like Flipgrid's awesome, but it's not, it's not in the same category as Seesaw and Canvas and Google Classroom. It's really a great supplemental, especially gathering videos. It's phenomenal. Um, but it isn't that tool. It's really not made to be that tool in the same respect as the other tools. So yeah, I'm gonna make sure I'm using Seesaw every day and I'm gonna to try to teach them in person how to use these and then constantly use them throughout those 10 days so that when we move to online, they are ready. That's an interesting, so it makes sense that because you'll have them in person that I guess part of my question wasn't really relevant to your situation, but I, you know, it's an interesting model and I guess it's at, outside of the scope of the time we have to talk about, you know, the, the nitty gritty details of all the varying different situations people are walking into this fall. But, um, okay. So you, in short, you're going to, you're going to have a little bit of time in person to instruct on the logistic yes. nature of these tools. But if, if I it. didn't, what I do is my children make these videos for the other children. So they make 90 right. second videos. So when they had to use Soundtrap, that wasn't, my third graders use Soundtrap in the spring. They hadn't done that since second grade. So again, they made small videos instead of like, here's how you use sand trap and would have taken like, you know, a very long video, it was dropped into little snippets. So it's like, here's how you're going to open the file. And cause I love that sound trap immediately goes into Google classroom, which is another platform we use. So right. <laughs> the third graders clicked on the assignment in Google classroom and boom, it opened up their sound trap file. And so it's like, they don't have to log in in a way that like go through the project, hit this, it was up. And I was like, yes. And then it's like, okay, you're going to do this. You're going to move the melody over and then make an intro. And that was one video. Now you're going to do this. And they, that was the next video. And now you're going to add a sound effect somewhere in there. And this, here's your sound effect. So like those little videos, as like Barb has told me, um, they work so much better for students than trying to give them a long lecture. So that's how I would do it online. That's how I did it this past um, uh, spring with third graders with Soundtrap and Flipgrid. It was very, very successful. They had never, they Soundtrap they had used in second grade, Flipgrid they had never used. So it just made short tutorial videos and it worked fine. Wow. Interesting. Okay. So extending this question, mm -hmm. <laughs> because I'm now I'm just asking out of my own personal interest. So if, um, like for me, I would probably have to add, and my general music class is really tiny, so it wouldn't, you know, I, I would just do what I did with music first last year where I would manually create the accounts for each student. Um, as far as parents go, like something that seems interesting about this to me is the portfolio part of it. Like, okay, my students have made their soundtrack assignments. You know, we can export the song as an mp3 put it in their google drive they can take it home this the seesaw um you know as far as like sharing with parents go would i be looking at a manual effort to get the parent contacts into the system also do you think um with seesaw they make it so intuitive to try not make it so manual on your end so with seesaw you click the plus family button and here's the thing with seesaw like that question that you referred to before if you decided to do this all by yourself then you need to have that contact information that you can get to the parents. You know, like you need to know some way to, the, Seesaw makes all that for you, but you still need to have the parents' contact info. So you need to have their info so you can send them the invite and say, get the app and connect to your child. Like they have to, like as a parent, I had to get the email from their teacher say connect with your child and then I had to look at the list find my child connect and then they had to approve that I was Sarah and Michaela's mom because if I'm not you know they reject me you right. can't be <laughs> and then you're on now seesaw for schools I did that back way when they were wee little ones and I've never had to do it again because it's seesaw for schools they stay I stay with their parent unless I tell them otherwise. So like I never had to um, reconnect with them again in Seesaw for schools, but Seesaw, the free version or even Seesaw plus, which is the paid version. 
you're still going to have to reconnect them every year. So if the school isn't helping you, that is going to be a manual part on your end. Okay. I, I'm like doing, I have live real-time update. Uh, Seesaw is on Howard County Public Schools digital schools approved list. Ah! <laughs> Allowed with special requirements. This digital tool is supplemental. Parents have the opportunity to opt out. And then the way, and it actually, this is interesting. I don't spend enough time here. The, um, it tells you specifically which Clever features it integrates with. So Seesaw offers SSO through Clever Instant Login. Do you know what SSO stands for? Um, it's a feed, right? Is a, do you, uh, are you asking me like you don't know or are you trying to quiz I me? I don't know. <laughs> no, I don't know. I have no idea. Like, I, I, what, 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 <laughs> I'm, guessing, I'm guessing that what that means is that they would not need to create I would not need to create a separate login. It's for, sure, for it's secure for sockets in. layer is a standard security technology for establishing an encrypted link between a server and a client, typically a web server and a browser or a mail server and a mail client. Look at you with your Google. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> My kids are like, is he quizzing me? I'm like, is it a something yeah. with an RSS? No, I just thought maybe you would, I thought maybe you would know since you knew what Clever no. was. I, all I know about Clever is, what I said earlier a few minutes ago, and that it is always in my way. That's all I know about Clever. <laughs> and we're, we're, our district is actually lightening up on this a little bit because of the current situation. Like we're actually, I, my understanding is that our music office is in the process of making some deals with some digital tools that were previously not oh, allowed. Great. It's amazing what, what happens, you know, and I've heard, this has been a theme with a lot of people who have come on the show is it's like the longer this, you know, I'm, I'm a little bit cynical about longer lasting ed tech reform due to this whole COVID situation. But the longer that we're in the situation, the more I'm slowly starting to see, like now our district is going to, all of our kids are going to have a Chromebook, a Chromebook one-to-one. -one right. This, this by the end of this fall. So, you know, I, while we would all rather be in person, I look at this and I'm thinking like, okay, well, we're getting some tools that we should have had like 10 years ago. Yes. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's interesting, but Seesaw appears to be, Fair game. It looks like a parent could say no if they wanted to, but that, uh, you know, I just don't see that. I, I mean, I think with uh, what I learned when I was researching through the ISTE, this ISTE certification process, the parents can say no to anything. If your school gives them a blanket form of like, I, I uh, approve what's on this list, which is on a website, so that list can be altered at any time, right? They actually right. have the right. <laughs> to say, I do not approve and you need to give an alternative way for my child. Now that's gonna make the teacher's life a living nightmare because it already is. Because look at right now, some of these teachers are living a nightmare because they're going to have to teach in person with students in their room and figure out how they're teaching an online academy. You know, so like, but that's this, there's before this COVID, last year when I was researching this, parents actually had the, uh, the, um, the ability to opt out of technology and require the school to give them an alternative method. Interesting. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> but now we're actually kind of seeing that, aren't we? We actually, right, yeah. we actually are living that, aren't we? <laughs> we are, yeah. Wow. Okay. Interesting. Well, in the interest of time, I'm going to change gears again. Go for it. Seesaw to something out. That's cool. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I, so I want to get to my only structured segment on the show, App and Album of the Week, but I want to talk first. There, are, You have been involved uh, in a number of projects this summer. I, there's a, a lot of them, and I, I guess I just wanted to give you the floor and ask, are there any of them in particular that you wanted to promote oh, now, good. this time? Oh, good. Yeah, sure. Um, this has been a very different summer for me, um, but in so many neat ways. Um so I, this is the first year summer I'm teaching at Lebanon Valley College. It was supposed to be one week intense course and we had to put it online for seven weeks. So I, I shout out to all the students in that class because that was, you know, <clears throat> not what we planned and they've been amazing and I've learned so much. It's been the best PD ever is teaching this class. They've been phenomenal. And then um, webinars because, you know, schools are reopening in some way, shape or form. I've done so many um, live webinars and um, been on a lot of conferences and this couldn't have happened at a most odd time but like I have been writing for two years for this book for Oxford University Press called Using Technology with Elementary Music Approaches and it's a book that has lessons for using technologies with Dr. Fire Robin's First Steps 
the Kodai approach and the Orff Schulich approach. So <clears throat> I have my good friend, Dr. Missy Strong, writing what the first steps approach is in the book. So she did that. And then I write lessons that go with the eight step workout. And then my good friend, Glennis Patterson, another uh, elementary music educator from New Jersey. So is Missy, so is Glennis. And Glennis wrote Kodai. I met Glennis in NYU during my Kodai level one. She was finishing up her Kodai level three. So she wrote the Kodai approach. And then I wrote uh, lessons that could be enhanced with technology. And then Artith Collins, who I've known through um, New Jersey Music Education Association. And I've always loved when she would bring her elementary classes to conferences and they do their ORF um, orchestrations. I've always loved that. So she wrote the ORF Schulerk um, briefing on it in the book. And then I wrote lessons that went with um, the ORF Schulerk approach as well as um, students with special needs who's uh, approached in that one so that they can make music. And then my good friend, Shree Herring, who works in South Carolina at the Hammond School, it's also a private school, so she and I always have very similar teaching environments. She and I wrote together the project-based learning portion. So it gives you a bunch of different project-based learning activities that solve problems, you know, the problem essential questions and things like that. So this book was in its final stage when we all went into quarantine. And it was like, this book was really, it, it was written in, you know, be post, pre, I'm sorry, pre-COVID. So I was like, oh my goodness. And I couldn't change much of the book. So I did get a little paragraph in like, this book is easily adaptable for online. Just, you know, take a step back and this book is adaptable. But Oxford University Press is running the book with a supplemental website and they let me have control over that. So they linked to me and so on the uh, supplemental website, every time I said, look at the website to see how this is done, look at the website for the manipulatives, on those videos, I constantly give them, here's how you would do this in a COVID world, like, uh, you know, in a COVID teaching. Oh, thank you. My husband's picking up the girls. <laughs> there we go. Um, oh, is that your 11, is that your 11.55? Yeah, yeah. So he, <clears throat> he's doing it because he went out, I think, to get breakfast. So he's picking up the girls. So he's so tired of hearing me talk to a computer <laughs> every morning. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry to make you do it another hour or two. <laughs> oh, no, it's, it's, it's going to happen up until uh, August 31st. It's all good. So, yeah, so this book has um, a supplemental website. So it has manipulatives and the teaching videos to it. And on those videos, I say, so in a COVID world, if you're teaching this, you can try it this way, this, this way. So this is coming out. <laughs> this is coming out in a Kindle version, according to Amazon, on August 18th, and it's definitely coming out in paper book on September, paperback on September 1st. So the website is why he keeps hearing me talk to the computer every day, is because I'm finishing and making sure that is running on a variety of platforms successfully and um, making it as simple as possible, basically. Like here's the chapter, click this link, and then there's, here's all the doc with the links on it. Like, okay, so on page this, that's a website link, I'm, you know, and I'm running all of them yeah, through yeah. the various uh, platforms so I can make it work. So uh, yeah, so the book is coming out next week in Kindle and then um, September 1st in paperback. Uh, two weeks ago, it had a little ribbon on it saying it was, <laughs> It was the number one, it was so funny, the number one new release in music instruction book. So that was like, it's not released yet. <laughs> but that's been taken off. But I was like, that's not out yet. Don't do that. <laughs> right. Yeah. I, I don't understand any of Amazon's um, meta, like book metadata, like number one on this list, number one on this. You know what I mean? I don't know. I don't yeah. understand. I'm sure you could read up on that and learn more. I don't know what it meant, but I, was, I, I did take a picture of it and sent it to my administration. <laughs> so I was so proud of that. <laughs> <That's awesome. laughs> but yeah, so this book is coming out. Um, thank you for letting me promote that. But it really is. I mean, I know it's going to say like, try this in stations and you're going to look at that and go, I can't do stations this year. So like, but then it says to the website example. So yesterday I was recording um, over here in this little corner of my room. I was like, so you can't do this in stations this year, but let me show you what you could do if you are six feet distance or if you are online. So I do try to adapt it. And that's why I wanted a website with it because as you know, Robbie, technology books can be outdated very quickly, especially since COVID had a hit right when I was finishing it. I know, right? <laughs> like it could have outdated it even quicker. So um 
that's why I like insisted on having a website that had so much on it so that like if you go to that website, the website will update and those materials like if I showing a video of Flipgrid, I can update it every time Flipgrid updates. So it doesn't look so like, oh, that's that was what Flipgrid looked like two years ago. So Right. Yeah, it's a counterpoint to the book. Yeah. To the text of the book. Yeah. So when I published with Oxford, I opted to not do the website and the reason for that was that I just felt like the, the you know, the, every technology that was listed in the book was so heavily, I wouldn't say veiled, but like dressed up with examples of like the underlying idea. Like it was almost a, how do you be, like when I talk about a task app, it's just as much like, what should a good task app do? And how do you philosophically be a person who gets things done in the music classroom? Like it was more that. So, I mean, I fully expected, I, I think there's a couple to-do apps in particular that Microsoft has bought and then killed since my book came out and it's like you know it's a paragraph of text i didn't know how an online website was going to really you know someone will just search for it on the app store and then it won't be there like that's, <laughs> that's yes the... so so when you do though i'm curious when you do have an oxford website associated with your book do you entirely control what's on that page like do you have to wait for um no. an update to push or do you just go log right in yeah. and then... they made a, a link off their website that links over to mine and mine's running off my website. So yeah, and I didn't mind that. I really wanted that creative control. So I was like, no, I, it, it can run off my website um, and you can link it to mine. I, I so wanted that control. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, maybe next time for me. I, I see now how I might have done it. I think in mine, I just have it linked to my blog, which is you know where I'm writing about some of this stuff in a more modern way. Yeah. Um, but yeah, interesting. So, okay. Um, and by, by the way, I should say, you said the, the paperback version is the 18th? or is uh, that No, the, the Kindle version, version is the 18th. And the okay, paperback... so the Kindle version, by the time I publish this, will be available if anyone wants to go in. Oh, yay. Okay. <laughs> yeah, and the, um, <clears throat> excuse me, the paperback version is September 1st. Awesome. Yeah, very cool. What about um, on, speaking of the web, like in addition to this website, what are places, because you're doing a lot of online conferences. I know you, you write, you you have you know you contribute blog posts to some websites like what are places on the web that people can find your work so amymburns.com is where i house pretty much everything and then the web or the blog that i i work with dr joe pisano on can link off of amymburns.com but it's musetech.net so come this past march joe has had that website for over a decade I was brought on in 2013. And then this past March, he's like, let's do a Facebook live events, you know? And I was like, okay. He's like, we'll do it through my Zoom. I was like, okay, sounds good. And he brought on Dr. Jeff Tedford from Grove City College. And um, we started out, I can't even believe we did this last March, but we were doing three shows a week, Monday, Wednesday, Friday. I don't even know what we were talking about, but we had a lot to talk about. We were, we were yeah. talking about transitioning into this online learning platform and uh, just giving a lot of tips and stuff. And then, you know, and we by June, we measured it to, to just Thursday nights at seven. So we were doing Thursday nights at seven. And then come the, um, around mid-July, they, they needed a break. I think they're coming back in the fall. But then I just, uh, last week, I took that Thursday night at seven and did a whole seesaw for elementary music educators with the updates they did, like what the updates can do for you. It was wonderful, and a big shout out to Katie Wardrobe and Shree Herring. Um, Katie came to me and said, well, how are you going to do that Facebook Live? And I was like, I looked at it and I said, I don't know, because it looks like it, I can't, I can share the screen that you can't see me. And I said, so I looked at this YouTube video and I'll stick my little head over in the side using Zoom, and then I'll share the screen in Facebook. And she was like, no, try this streaming service like she uses, and it was, a godsend it was so easy it was like one click and everything worked magically even though i had no power because we had to go to a hotel <laughs> because oh my gosh. our tropical storm knocked out our power for a few days <laughs> so oh my goodness yeah i ended up going to a hotel um and doing this live webinar but so i did that last week and then the next one i haven't planned when it was going to be i don't think it's going to be next week i'm thinking i'll advertise next week for the week after i'm going to do um Flipgrid. So I'm probably going to do it again at the musetech.net Facebook live page. We'll do a, I'll do a Flipgrid for elementary music educators, probably not next week, but the week after. NJMEA has me up next week. 
them doing a webinar on virtual music instruments. So, because like you said, Robbie, thank goodness some of these most districts are finally going into one-to-one -one devices. I'm sorry to say it's not all. I really wish all so that students had some sort of consistency in their educational guidance because those who aren't getting that, it's it's just becoming a very un very unfair world for them. Um, so I yeah. really wish that they were all able to have that access. But since most are, and we can, a lot of people I've been reading can't play their instruments, can't sing this year, they can't share, but they have these devices. There are great ways that they can play music on their devices. So that's what my webinar is next week for NJMEA. So yeah, musetech.net, Facebook page, musetech.net, same one, or amyambirds.com. And yeah, it's, it's, been, it's been a really busy summer. It's been great though. I love sharing the knowledge and I've loved working with so many new people that I've never met before in different counties and districts and states and countries. I did um, a webinar for Denise Gagne and uh, Artie Almeida because they did their Odyssey of the Minds for Music Play and I did a seesaw with Music Play. So it was fun to uh, uh, do a a stream into Canada. I love that. Wow. Cool. <laughs> You're doing so much. It's awesome. Um, real quick, before before I forget, what is the streaming service that Katie turned you on to that you ended up using? Good one. What? It, like, this is how tired I am. I'm like, if I wasn't so tired, I'll oh, stream yard. There we go. I'm like, if I wasn't so tired, I could tell you right off the top of my head. <laughs> but I've been like working hard to get this website, making sure it's so good by the 18th. So yeah, it's streamyard.com. So there's a free service you can use. And if you use the free service, it's going to stream to one of your social media uh, channels. Now, let's say you have YouTube and Facebook like she does if you pay for the service, you can stream without the watermark and be able to stream to multiple services. But that was really great. She, uh, she wrote me after I like advertised it and said I was gonna you know, piece it together this way. And she said, make the event through StreamYard. So I did that, um, which was great because I waited a few days and remade the event with StreamYard so it, it, it showed up higher on the feed. And then all people had to do was click it and it just, it started and it went over to the YouTube channel. It went over to the Facebook channel. So it's there, it pre-records there, like it's live. So it's going to sit there. I don't have to worry about hitting the zoom button or anything. Like it's already going live and it was so simple and it did a countdown. Like it, it had everything for you. And it was great because like, that's what I need. I need something that just says, click the button and it's all done for you. <laughs> like, yep. Yep. And she gave me a tutorial. She was awesome. Like a big shout out to Katie Wardrobe. And if anyone knows Katie, you know she's awesome. And her Midnight Music um, community there, it's great. Uh, and she did a webinar last night. And she, um, she sent me a Loom tutorial video on how to use it. <laughs> and I was like, this is awesome. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, so StreamYard.com. And again, you can do it for free. You can use it for free or pay a monthly subscription. And um, I mean, once Joe comes back, I can cancel my subscription because Joe has the Zoom that he pays for and therefore it goes on to YouTube and it goes on to Facebook that way. But um, I wasn't gonna bother Joe while he's nicely on a break. <laughs> yeah, is that, is, does he have the webinar account? Cause I looked into that for, I hosted the Facebook teach, you know, the one that was last week oh, yeah. that was broadcast to all the music educators on the music teaching Facebook group. And, um, that was a, you know, pretty low maintenance event. And I, you know, I, we used zoom, it was small enough that we just, I just had a zoom, giant zoom call that we, you know, had a waiting room and everyone entered in and then we ran it all on zoom. Um, it was not streamed to Facebook live, but I think you can do, there's like a webinar, a webinar add on you can pay for in your zoom account he must have that he he, uh, he must he can he can get us on facebook and youtube at the same time so yeah he must that's got to be in the f paid version though in Streamyard, you you can't do both at the same time but you can do one in the free version yeah interesting um yeah oh gosh the youtube streaming thing that's another subject of frustration for me i'm trying to either i have a lot of very valid reasons to stream on youtube but i just have not like really put a ton of time into i have a couple of fairly successful videos but nowhere near the breadth of content that i need to get to the 1000 subscriber requirement in order to live stream 
Yes. Yes. <laughs> and it's, yeah, it seems like it's the most, um, I don't want to, all of the, all of the web streaming things are cross platform, but it's, it's like the most, you know, it's the least, um, it's the most agnostic, you know, like mo anyone can just click a YouTube link and you don't need a Facebook account or anything. So it would be, it would be uh, very useful to me, but they have that, uh, that 1000 subscriber limitation. So everyone listening, subscribe to me on YouTube so I can. What is it? What's your YouTube channel? <laughs> <laughs> it's just Robbie Burns. That's there the you other go. thing. <laughs> Robbie Burns, so subscribe. He needs a thousand. He needs a thousand. Let me go. And I'm going to do it right now, everyone. See, I I'm, go into YouTube. I, thank <laughs> you very much. I'm like 800, um, more than 800 away from. Oh, come on, <laughs> y'all. We have to get there. Now, this problem with you have the same issue I do with this last name of Burns, right? So which one are you? Like <laughs> oh gosh, are there a lot of us? Yeah, yes, let's... I'm gonna try. Katie says like when she's trying to find me, she has to put Amy Burns music. That's why. I, oh, there we go. Subscribe. Did it. All right. That's why I have to do like I do Amy M Burns, like Amy M Burns, um, because Amy Burns is just too generic. And uh, it's yeah, it's you have 194 subscribers. That's what it says. Okay. Oh, I'm yeah, 195 that's... now. Yay! Oh, nice. Yay! <laughs> Wait, seriously, Subscribe. you can't do a, you can't go live unless you have a thousand. You need a thousand subscribers. Wow, I never knew that. This seems like a big. I understand that it's part of their content creator business model, like how they want to monetize the people who are making a living off YouTube. But it seems like, I mean, Google definitely has the money and the servers bandwidth to host you know uh, any amount of people doing this kind of thing it seems like they are missing an opportunity here like they could be like why like twitch wouldn't even exist if it weren't for the fact that i mean they, maybe they would i mean they're doing like their whole like started out as like a gaming streaming service but i just feel like youtube would be taking a huge bite into that if they would just allow anyone to do it i don't get it but i'm so confused because if i hit the little um create a video post and then go live i can go live and i don't have a thousand subscribers that's for sure and might maybe it's on mobile maybe the limitation is when you're on a mobile device oh try your desktop maybe it works okay i don't know yeah maybe oh interesting yeah so now you, you were talking about the, the streaming service that would be why that would have not limited you if you didn't have a thousand subscribers because you you right but like i'm here on youtube and if i hit go live it's all ready to help me have me go live and i don't really yeah. like encourage people to come to my youtube channel like you know it's it's there for my organizational purposes <laughs> but that's interesting like yeah i could hit start and yeah built a webcam no setup use your existing go if i hit go and allow uh, I might start streaming. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, you're right. You're right. Okay, so I, I need to correct my statement then. It's it's a mobile limitation. Oh, okay. Well, there you go. <laughs> but this was more relevant to me when I was, I mean, a lot of things I'm doing now in front of my computer. So I guess that limitation is less relevant to me now than it was. I mean, I, I, what I wanted to do was stream concerts. Oh, and, okay. And and other other kinds of things. That was when we first broke and I was looking, you know, I think at first there was, a, when all of us, were no longer in school. I think there was like this period for the first month or so of everyone just trying to be as creative as possible online. And before there was any necessary focus or structure to the tools or the ways people were using them in collaboration, you know, I was just, I know myself, I was just doing some Facebook living and some Twitch streaming and just trying to like figure out how to connect in any way possible in an internet only kind of way. So but yeah, that was a limitation I ran into for YouTube pretty early on. Wow. Good to so know. There you go. Okay, so I could stream from my MacBook. Interesting. Yeah. <laughs> I always learn new things. I always learn new things. So do you want to talk about album and app of the week? Um, yeah, the app, I, I do have one, but I'm trying to figure out. I used it last week. I've used it a couple of times now, and I wish... Yeah, if I, if I don't know the name of it, it's going to be pointless to say it. Um, it is an app that allows me to flip the camera when I'm recording. Hmm. Okay. <laughs> so it's a mobile even, app. It's a mobile app, and like I've been having to do these videos where I show, like I start talking, and then I I I want to flip the camera around, and I didn't know on an iPhone, even on the iPhone 11 Max that I have, that you can't do that. You can't flip in mid-record. I ran into this exact limitation yesterday where I was trying to make 
a video of me. I made this series shortcut that like for working out in the house that turns up the air in the bedroom and then like turns on the Peloton app on the Apple TV and then starts the Apple watch workout automatically all in one tap. Yeah. And I was trying to show it off and it's, I'm making the video. It's my face saying like, all right, here's how it yes. works. And then flipping the video to show it. And then it wouldn't, I had to like make a separate video to show. Right. And I didn't want to do other. that. And I did find an app that's free that does it. And I did it fine. And unfortunately, like when I downloaded it, I didn't put it in any folder and it threw it wherever there was probably an empty space on my phone, which means it's not on the last page. And I'm like, oh, here it is. Got it. Um, timestamp camera app allows you to switch the camera around. And I've had to use this for the last couple of weeks in webinars because I need to show like I'm talking to them and then I want to go and show like literally use my phone to show my iPad to show that um, like it's it's that issue where Flipgrid nor Seesaw allows you to show a video and record yourself singing along with that video. You have to jump the tab in Chromebooks, but in iOS devices, you can't jump the tab. It can't like you can't put a link in. It opens a new tab. You start, you know, you hit record back in the first tab, go over to the second tab, start singing along, go back to the first tab and shut it off. Can't do that in the iOS app. So you have to do the screen recording and maybe even if you're tech savvy enough, do the screen split so you can get the video as the same way. But like to show that I didn't want to stop the video, you know, to, like so I use this app timestamp camera so that I could flip the camera around while I was recording this. That's awesome. Such a nice, that's a ex perfect example of from before, what an app that does one thing and does it well. Yeah, <laughs> like, the only reason I use it, it does, it does put a timestamp on it. Though I'm sure, like, I haven't ever explored the app. It's really, literally, I just wanted to do one thing at one moment, and it did, like, for two days, and it did it. That's all I needed it for. So, like, I'm sure there's a way to turn the timestamp off. <laughs> sure. Yeah, there was, um, there, now that you're mentioning this, there was a, at the announcement, because, you know, I watch all the Apple things i'm a big nerd about that and uh th at the event that they announced the iphone 11 they had a app demo on stage but it was more of a professional film yes. app but what it was doing was like using the different the front facing and the back facing three different cameras as separate videos that were all simultaneously recording yes uh, and then like sort of allowing you to import that into uh, a video editor of your choice and then have the multiple, you know, edit the multiple camera angles as B-roll. So, so for that, Robbie, I use Mixcam app. Okay, cool. Yeah. And that a, will. A double this, feature. Yeah, yeah. A double, <laughs> double feature. Double feature. <laughs> <laughs> the double feature album. Um, yeah. Mixcam allows you to use both cameras at the same time. I don't know if you probably could do that in the iPhone. I, for some reason, I downloaded this app. For some reason, I needed it. And that's what I thought was my flip camera app. That I realized, oh, no, that does, that records at the same time, both cameras. Right, right. Uh, awesome. Yeah, I, I don't think you can do it in the stock camera app. I've fiddled around with it. I, th I think I am competent enough with where all the buttons are that I've never seen. And can I give a third option. shout out app? Yeah, sure. Okay, so this is the F-O-C-O-S Focus. Now, the reason I use this app is, so we were doing town assemblies online this past spring and recitals. And I don't want people seeing my whole house, but the piano is in the dining room. So I wanted to use like the portrait view as a video and you can't do that. But of course, a great hacker told me use this app and it worked. So this app is F-O-C-O-S, it's you know, Focus, and it totally blurs out the background, like completely blurs it out. So it was just Sarah, her piano, and everything else was a blur. And then I used the screen recording tool on the iPhone to video that. So it doesn't itself record video no. in the app you, okay. It's <laughs> but, basically like a, like a window or like a yeah. pair of binoculars. Okay. Yeah, but it totally like in its window, before you, you like would use it to take a picture, it show it's blurred out everything and you can control the amount of blur you want. And right. then, yeah, but you still have to edit out kind of like the ch tools that are underneath her. Like if she was playing, the tools were on the bottom of the screen. You do have to go into iMovie and edit those out, but that wasn't hard. Yeah. Hmm. Wow. All right. Awesome. That's great. All super practical, you know, single use utilities. I love it. Yes. Um, speaking of utilities, you're you're on a Mac right now, right? You use Yes. 
you, so you're um, using a Mac. I mean, as music teachers, I'm sure that you have spent some time in the sound settings of your system preferences before. Yes. Um, pretty annoying to have to dig in there when you're playing with an audio interface or setting the audio in or out of a Zoom call or of yes. your, you know, your recording <laughs> garage band. Um, there is an app by a company called Rogue Amoeba that has just released their fifth version. The app is called SoundSource. Uh -huh. And SoundSource puts um, an icon in your menu bar at the top of your Mac screen. And, this, you know, you can have, there's like the Mac system audio, which just allows you to choose the input and the output. Yeah. But what SoundSource does is it allows you to, it shows you all of your inputs and outputs just from one click of the menu bar icon. And then you can choose on an app specific basis where each one of your apps directs to in your ins and outs and how loud each one is. And if you have third party audio plugins, you can even like a you're almost as if you're in a digital audio workstation, you can like route audio plugins through things on an input output or even app specific basis. Yeah, I have the website All, up. This looks amazing. It's so good. You so you just click the little icon and then it like it's a little pop down window and you so like for me right now my input and my output is set to my audio interface, but if I wanted to really quickly set my input to um include, you know, like third party apps, I have a another app made by Actually, last last episode's app of the week for me was Loopback, which is another app by this company that lets you combine different sources into one new device. So I could say, like, take my mic, take the audio output from Logic Pro, take the audio output from the music app and from Chrome, and then make all of that into one new input device that I can select from the system settings. That's amazing. And it's great. So I can now get, like, native audio output from, like, if I want to show a YouTube video, in a zoom in a we use we use google meet if i want to show my google meet classroom uh a youtube video now instead of it just coming out of my computer speakers and right back directly through my microphone they're getting the actual sound output from the web tab it's pretty cool it's cool and sound source you know it just lets you choose all this stuff you can my zoom calls sometimes come in a little bit loud when i'm teaching my private lessons you know because it's usually when they're playing xylophone so yeah so Right from that menu, I can just make the Zoom call, you know, I can take it down to like 41% volume. I love it. That's great. It's cool. It's a real nice utility. Um, Rogue Amoeba, make, maker of very cool um, apps that hack your Max audio. Really nice. I love it. That's great. Oh, my goodness. Thank you for that. Thank you. Oh, yeah, you got it. Super cool. Um, so are you, are you listening to any music that's worth talking about? Um, I mean, I'm always listening to music and it always depends like <laughs> where like my head is at the time. You know, normally at this time of year, I'd be listening to holiday concert music to be honest, <laughs> because like that would be kind of what's my far reaching goal is we get that done, you know, so, cause that would be for December. And then of course, like kind of things we would do on the Halloween parade in October, so those aren't in my library right now. So my oldest daughter, she is musical theater. Like she, she just started as Jasmine and Aladdin. Like their playhouse is working and it's fully functional. And they're just doing very small productions of like eight to nine kids. So we were listening to Aladdin. And this month she is flounder in uh, The Little Mermaid. So we were talking about Disney Plus and Hamilton because we haven't sat down to watch Hamilton yet. And we still haven't. And I said, you know, Lin-Manuel Miranda, 2008 in the Heights. I'm like, just like, I know Hamilton is what he's known for. But I got to tell you, I mean, that musical, I adored it. And I hadn't listened to the soundtrack in probably a few years. So I was playing that for her. And that's that's been my soundtrack in my head right now. I mean, it's just, I that had such a cool rhythm and just styles like multiple styles in that soundtrack what he was doing with like hip-hop rap along with like samba and I mean and then the choreography that went along with it like that was that was a really great show I know he's he's Hamilton you know they're all about Hamilton but like 
go back to his roots on that show where he wo- wrote in college because he was missing home. And it's like, that's a show you, you just go, oh my goodness, you knew he was going to become big. And that's, that was his freshman project. You were like, whoa, what he is going to do is going to be phenomenal. And then he came out with him later. You're like, oh yeah, yeah there it is. Or five years later. Yep. Yeah. So I've been listening to In the Heights. Nice. That should be on the Disney Plus needs to just be added to the list of things that if you listen to numerous episodes of this podcast, you will eventually be so persuaded to buy that. You have no <laughs> right. <choice. laughs> yeah. How about you? Um, oh, yeah. So for me, well, I've just been I've been listening to a, a handful of things lately. Um, I, some One thing that stands out is an album that is called Clear Line. It's by Jacob Garchik, who is a trombonist and composer I was unfamiliar with until this album was recommended. Um, I forget, gosh, I gotta, I don't remember exactly where this was recommended to me, um, but it is a, I don't know, progressive jazz is something that I say a lot. I, I don't know if that's helpful for someone to understand it, but it is most certainly like a very modern jazz record that um, blurs the lines of genre quite a bit. But what I like about it is that it's like all wind instruments. Like it's got kind of like a big band instrumentation, but minus all of the non-wind instruments. So wow. yeah, it's um, it's got uh, just a bunch of wind instruments associated typically with jazz that are like playing these very, very complex rhythmically and harmonically um, uh, you know, charts that Jacob Garchik wrote that um, are honestly like very like the the level of um, virtuoso that is like happening from each one of these musicians. Like to be able to play the level of uh, complex metric modulations and rhythms, and also like just the technical dexterity that goes into articulating and lining up some of the ideas that he has composed on this record are just truly amazing and with no rhythm section so like all of the the rhythm is coming from the clarity of attack of like the alignment of it because you know like wind instruments don't have as percussive an attack sound as all of the rhythm instruments in a jazz group so you're getting a lot of that added clarity and percussiveness from how accurately they're able to line up the notes that they play and it's just such a big group and the um the concepts are so you know, large and complex that it's really quite amazing. It's not like dinner background music. Uh, yeah. <laughs> okay. <it> is, yeah. <laughs> it's but it's a real ride. Uh, I really really like it. Um, and yeah, I would recommend it. Jacob Garchik, Clear Line. Awesome. Yeah, I'll link all the stuff in the in the notes to the episode. I'm gonna actually, I might have to text you this week to get all the iTunes links. Or no, we don't call it iTunes anymore. Do we? App Store, Matt. The App Store. All the App Store. Yeah. Links to the to the stuff you mentioned and um. Um, is there anything else you, I, you know, we, we've gone a little over the time. I think that was your goal. Do you want to, do you want to call Yeah, I'm all here? good. No, yeah, this was great. Awesome. Yeah, it was so great. Um, I, you know, I'm glad that I'm doing this show more often because it's honestly very overdue to have you on. Ah, oh, thanks. Um, be, you know, being, being that we are, what should we, how should we define our, relationship i mean we're not related but i think the fact that we're doing things in music technology and share the um the the very the very great last name of burns the very great last name yes it's so funny because there's also chris burns down in florida yep 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 so so on every birthday he's like hey it's happy birthday from chris burns that's not your husband chris burns (laughs) oh my god thanks chris burns (laughs) so yeah just the burns music that's that's how we'll that's how we'll define it. Yes. <laughs> or it's like, my students always say, I, "There's um in Socrative, I'm like, now just go to Burns Music 41," and they're like, "We, why would you ever call your classroom Burns Music?" They're like, "Why are you burning music, Mrs. Burns?" Oh. I'm like, "No, Burns Music for ah." Oh. <laughs> Amy, it's been awesome having you yeah. on Music Ed Tech Talk this week, and thank you for. All of the many things. Uh, thank you, Robbie. It's been great to be here. Yeah, we'll have to do it again sooner than five years into me having a podcast. <laughs> okay. <laughs>
Thanks for listening to Music Ed Tech Talk. You can find the show page, show notes for this episode, and the blog at musicedtechtalk.com. Learn more about my music and teaching career at robbieburns.com. I'm on Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube, also at Robbie Burns. Please rate and review this show in the podcast app. It absolutely helps. It'll only take a second and just a few taps. Word of mouth is helpful too, so please spread the word. If you'd like to read more, you can buy my book, Digital Organization Tips for Music Teachers, from Oxford University Press or Amazon.com. See you next time.